Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of our CT evaluation of gastric malignancies, pearls, and pitfalls. And last time we were finishing up with, or starting perhaps, metastasis to the stomach. And I mentioned metastasis are, in fact, becoming more common these days. As patients live longer from a better treatment, they will develop metastasis in areas which typically we didn't see before. Stomach is one of them. The classic theme for stomach is linitis plastica from breast cancer, but you're also going to see nodules from melanoma, perhaps, or solitary masses from melanoma, or renal cell carcinoma might be two things you can think about. Though breast cancer is a common cancer, it really metastasizes to the stomach. When it does, the most common presentation is linitis plastica. It's interesting, linitis plastica very much looks like an infiltrating adenocarcinoma, so it's kind of a bit tricky if I told you this was a carcinoma, you would say no problem. But then again, once the patient has known breast cancer, it makes it fairly easy to come up with the right diagnosis. So that becomes very important. Beautiful example with linitis plastica. Of course, the challenge is confusing that with lack of gastric distension. With linitis plastica, you see mucosal hyperenhancement typically, and then the wall is diffusely homogeneous but thickened. You also see in this example, ascites and carcinomatosis. Again, beautifully shown, particularly on the axial views. Here it is the infiltration shown with MIP and volume rendering. And here it is with cinematic rendering. I kind of really like the cinematic showing the difference between the uh, mucosa and submucosal regions. Here's another patient, linitis plastica. Again, diffuse thickening of the stomach, involving the entire stomach, most typically, as well as ascites and carcinomatosis. Here it is in coronal and 3D volume rendering. Patients who do have linitis plastica often will have metastasis. Metastasis are commonly to bone, right? And you can see the, the multiple sclerotic bone mets. And here's another example of that infiltration in a patient with uh, linitis plastica due to breast cancer. And here's a third example, a bit more ascites, a bit more carcinomatosis, really diffuse infiltration, beautifully shown in this example. Again, bone mets are seen as well. I mentioned melanoma. Melanoma is always one of those things we seem to have unusual appearances and can look like anything. Mets of the stomach can come from lung cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma. They're usually solitary, but can be multiple. They're commonly in the submucosal region, but can be serosal. Here is a large melanoma met, which looks very much like a gist tumor, right? And in fact, I read this as a gist tumor. Patient had abdominal pain, was young. Exophytic mass, somewhat necrotic, looks classic like a gist tumor, very nicely shown. Uh, here's another example. You look at this case with a patient with GI bleeding. You look at this non-contrast scans. Maybe the gastric folds are thickened. Here it is again on the a bit further in the antrum. Now you see multiple lobulations in the stomach. There are multiple masses. And this is not just simply polyps because variable sizes, including some of them in the 2 to 3 centimeter range. You give IV contrast. Now you can see, particularly along the posterior gastric wall, that large polypoid mass with some enhancement. And you particularly can see it nicely here on the coronal views. Just a really nice example of a large mass with some enhancement. Again, you could think about a primary tumor. You could think about an intraluminal gist tumor. This was metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And I have seen a number of renal cell carcinomas now presenting with GI bleeding, as well as um, the cause being gastric metastasis. You can see the patient has had a prior right nephrectomy. Another example, look at this case. At first glance in this patient with GI bleeding, it looks like foreign matter in the stomach, but you look more carefully, you're looking at a large polypoid mass. Yes, the patient has ascites, and yes, the patient has liver metastasis as well, but look at the size of that mass in the stomach. When I show it to you with volume rendering, you could see its enhancement and its lobulations. And there it is particularly pretty, the large lobulations. I mean, that's just a terrific appearance of this patient with metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma to the stomach. So again, you can see not only does it occur, but it has a range of appearances. Another example, GI bleeding, you see high density blood in the stomach. 
and you see the posterior gastric wall, you can see the act of bleeding right here. And you might say, well, what could this be? Could this be an ulcer? Could it be tumor? The patient does have you know, vascular lesions in the liver. The patient also has had, you can see here, a partial nephrectomy. And so you can see the answer is metastatic renal cell carcinoma to the stomach presenting with GI bleeding. Just a beautiful example. Now, the cases I've showed you probably make the point that isolated stomach involvement in a patient with a history of renal cell is rare, and that indeed is going to be the case. Now, I should also mention, at least briefly, there are benign gastric tumors, which can be somewhat overlapping with some of the malignancies. We talk about neurogenic tumors. We talk about smooth muscle tumors, lipomas, and gastric polyps. Here's a nice example of a polypoid mass in the antrum. It's beautiful polypoid appearance, but it does have some increased vascularity. I don't think you can call it a benign polyp. This was on biopsy and then resection and inflammatory polyp. But you can imagine how you could worry about a malignancy. Again, uh, polyps don't typically enhance, but they may, as in this case. Lipomas are rare in the stomach. When they get large, they can bleed or intersuscept. They're submucosal in location, usually found in the gastric antrum and most typically an incidental finding unless they're really large. Lipomas, be it small bowel, large bowel, or stomach, are usually easy to recognize. Well circumscribed, fat attenuation around minus 100. Ulcerations typically only occur when the lesions are large, and then the patients often will present with GI bleeding. And as I mentioned, particularly in small bowel, they can present with intersusceptions. Here's a nice example of a 3 centimeter lipoma in the gastric fundus, classic fat attenuation. Here it is in the coronal views as well. Here's another example of a mass in the antrum of the stomach, as well as in the duodenum. Just a very nice example of small bowel and gastric lipomas. And here it is again on some of the 3D volume rendered views. What about this case? At first glance, you say there's a mass in the stomach, but it's kind of unusual. It's going in the lumen, but it's somewhat exophytic. Maybe it's a gist tumor, but it's water density. It's almost the same density as the water in the stomach. Well, it's protruding in the stomach. What could this be? There aren't many choices. You could say, well, gist tumor, but nah, we said that's not going to work because gist tumors are solid. This is water attenuation. What's cystic? Cystic tumors, a... Um, mesenteric cyst pushing in. No, you got to be thinking about a gastric duplication cyst. And you look at this from the coronals to the 3D, just a beautiful example of a large polypoid mass that is water attenuation sitting inside the stomach, and this was a gastric duplication cyst. Just a really nice example of that. You can see it here uh, as I show you the volume rendering with a little bit of motion. This case also makes the point, look at the folds in the stomach. Look how nicely you can see the orientation of the mass, its intraluminal component, as well as the gastric folds. So just a very nice example of how much information we can get from cinematic rendering and how much you can get from interactivity rather than just looking at static images. Now, another example, look at this mass pushing on the stomach posteriorly. It's cystic. Is this in the gastric wall? Is it near the stomach? Is it a pseudocyst? What could it be? Well, when you look at all of the images, it's very much in the region of the gastric wall. Water density, this was a gastric duplication cyst. Just a really nice example. Now, gastric duplication cysts, 7% of GI tract duplications. Most are non-communicating, spheric or ovoid closed cysts with the most common location, as the cases I showed you, being the greater curvature. The clinical picture depends on the size and location, often incidental findings, but occasionally can present with abdominal pain. What about this case? This is an interesting case. Look at the patient's uh, body of the stomach. What is this cystic lesion? Could this be a duplication cyst? Looks like it has a bit of enhancement by the wall. Maybe it's a submucosal process that's cystic, what is that? Here it is again on the sagittal and coronal view. I don't know what it is. It kind of looks benign to me, but it's cystic with rim enhancement. Well, there aren't that many things that can give you this appearance. Here's another example of the same thing. Here it's more solid. It's the interior wall of the stomach. 
Okay, what is that? And I'm telling you, these are the same diagnosis. One is cystic and one is solid. Both are isolated lesions in the stomach. This one enhances. The other one had a little bit of rim enhancement. And this is the unusual diagnosis of heterotopic pancreatic tissue. Um, pancreatic tissue can be in the duodenum, can be in the stomach, can simulate all sorts of polypoid lesions. It's often never thought about, only on biopsy is the diagnosis made. So here's that first case again, the cystic appearance, exceedingly unusual. This article about uh, heterotopic pancreas, an entity where pancreatic elements are found outside the gland proper, very small percent, and in most cases, patients are asymptomatic. The stomach and duodenum have been described as the most frequent sites, with the stomach being the most common in this one series. Again, usually antrum by greater curvature within three to six centimeters of the pylorus. Okay, just a really unusual finding. It's great for quiz conferences, of course, but it's also something to think about. And again, most cases are asymptomatic and incidentally dis discovered. So again, it's something in that differential when you're seeing solitary masses in the antrum of the stomach. Now, one of the last things I'll speak about is gastritis. One of the challenges we have with CT is if patients have gastritis, it can very much simulate carcinoma. This was a patient with an infiltrating tumor, I thought, in the antrum. On biopsy times two, this was gastritis. It's often due to NSAID, corticosteroid, or antibiotic use. The appearance of fold thickening, possibly with ulceration, can very much simulate malignancies. Again, endoscopy and biopsy will be the way you often reach the diagnosis. Other times, the history can be more helpful. You look at this patient with abdominal pain and weight loss, look at the fold size in the fundus. You can think about miniatriase, could be bad gastritis, but you'd have to make certain the patient doesn't have a tumor, and this was chemical gastritis. Just again, look at the fundus compared to the body. Really impressive, the appearance, and here it is with cinematic. So I will make the point that at times gastritis can be very confusing, and even with cinematic rendering, the cinematic rendering with the markedly thickened folds makes me think more about malignancy than simply inflammatory disease. Now, when you talk about gastritis, it's most frequently associated with H. pylori infection, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, alcohol abuse, or systemic illness. Patients with gastritis can present with acute symptoms like epigastric or abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, which perhaps make it easier on CT to reach the diagnosis um, however, again, uh, it can be somewhat challenging. This article by Juntandi looked at many of these emergencies. Now, one of the things we showed before is gastric ulceration can occur with neoplasm, but also in the acute setting, here's a beautiful example, diffuse thickening of the stomach wall, but you can see the pneumoperitoneum and you can see the perforation, okay? Perforated gastric ulcer with H. pylori gastritis. There was no tumor present, but you could see how markedly thickened the stomach is and why at least you surely would consider the tumor and why surely this patient will end up with uh, endoscopy. Another example, look at the thickening in the body of the stomach. Could this be an infiltrating process? It surely simulates a tumor. You surely have to be concerned about infiltration, but this was simply a gastritis. Another example, now more commonly patients with gastritis often have other issues. One of the common things is cirrhosis, but this is a bit different. Look at these polypoid lesions in the antrum of the stomach. These were thickened mass-like antral folds in a patient with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. These simulated a gastric cancer, and again, gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, are all not uncommon in patients with cirrhosis, particularly alcohol-induced cirrhosis. So you would have to think about a neoplasm, but this was patient was lucky, I guess. Very impressive fold pattern, just a really great example. And here it is very nicely on uh, the uh, cinematic rendering with these large edematous antral folds due to hepatic gastropathy. Really a wonderful, wonderful case. Another patient with acute abdomen presentation, look at the body of the stomach. Again, could this be gastritis? Yes, but look how focal it looks. You have to be thinking about a neoplasm, maybe an incidental adenocarcinoma. 
Maybe that's the source of the patient's symptoms. There's an ulceration present, but still it's so focal, you have to be considering neoplasm. And I would read this as an ulceration with a carcinoma. The fundus looks good. The lower antrum looks good. This is an infiltrating tumor in the body. This has to be a tumor. This was a gastric ulcer with wall thickening, being more focal, simulating a gastric cancer. So again, I think from a CT perspective, we're going to call and be suspicious for neoplasm, and sometimes it's just going to be an ulcer. Another example, GI bleeding. We talk about GI bleeding, and CT is great for lower extremity, lower GI bleeds beyond the ligament of trites, but it can be very helpful here as well. Look at the patient's posterior gastric wall. There's wall thickening there, and there's an ulceration right there. And you can see it on the sagittal view, beautiful ulceration, mini perforation posteriorly from the posterior gastric wall. But look how nicely you can see the break in the gastric wall in this patient with an ulceration. And look at the cinematic, there's the ulcer. Have you ever seen an ulcer so beautifully? This is how it would look in endoscopy. There's that button ulcer, beautifully shown with cinematic rendering. Just a really great case that I had to shoot a few more images to show that even better. And here it is from the sagittal perspective again. So one of the things that uh, cinematic rendering can help you with is looking for small ulcerations. It may not help you say whether that ulceration is an inflammatory process or a neoplasm, but it really can pick up the ulcerations very nicely. And here's one more example. Look at that ulceration. And this is kind of a classic appearance. So uh, really just a very nice example. And that patient, again, perforated also with no malignancy. So again, you would have been concerned, but there was no malignancy. So now I've gone through a number of the different gastric tumors. I've spoken to you about exam protocol. I've discussed some of the classic and maybe not so classic appearances of adenocarcinoma and lymphoma and gist tumor and metastasis. I've spoken about pitfalls. I've spoken about differential diagnosis, whether it's things like annular pancreas or glomus tumors or simply gastritis with ulceration. So we recognize the challenge. And hopefully, after you look at all three parts of this talk, you know how to better evaluate the stomach. But again, let me just emphasize, oral contrast, positive or neutral, distend the stomach. And with that, have a great day. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.